Welcome to Unlapped, Katie George, Nate Saunders, Lawrence Edmondson. As always, gentlemen, hello. We have some breaking news in the world of Formula One. F1 has denied Andretti's bid into the sport in 2025 and 2026. So there's that. But today is a very special episode of Unlap because former team principal of Haas F1, Gunther Steiner, is joining us. I love when timing works out. Hello and welcome to Gunther Steiner. Well, Gunther, I don't know if you'd consider this good timing or bad, but we're going to start with the news of the day, which is F1 just announced it's rejecting Andretti's bid into the sport for 2025 and 2026. Now, a possible injury into 2028 is still on the table. Just what's your immediate reaction to the news? This is complete news to, uh, to me. So thanks for bringing me some news, Katie. You know, uh, uh, no, my reaction is, uh, uh, I think I, I haven't seen the bit what they did to get into 25. So, you know, it's always difficult to comment on something when you don't when you don't know the details. I always be, uh, I wouldn't say careful about it, but uh, it's like you're not uh, working with the same information other people have got. Obviously, F, F, F1, FOM uh, has looked into it and uh, they think it's better that they reopen it, as you just said, as far as I understand it, that they have to reapply or something like this for 28. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, they must have the reasons why to do that. And I would say to come in in 25, you don't give yourself a lot of time, to be honest. You know, it's only, uh, I mean, the car needs to be ready at this time next year. And, uh, uh, you know, obviously they have done some groundwork as far as I read. I've not spoken with anybody, but it's still very difficult. And then if you think about 26, again, a complete new regulation and a complete new car again, I think they just looked at it and said it's a, maybe a little bit too ambitious. And again, I have to say, I don't know uh, uh, what they proposed, how they're going to do it. So I'm out of that loop and I don't need to be in it. But Gunther, you do have experience of bringing a new team into Formula 1. Of course, you're the last person to do it with, with Haas and, and relatively successfully compared to the other teams. Just how big a proposition is it when you're starting with basically nothing to come and build something up and, and put something together that is not only going to be on the grid, but also competitive, because that's a big thing that F1 said. They want Andretti to be competitive if they make the step in. Yeah, you're saying the right thing. It, uh, uh, it is, when we came, it was a complete different uh, uh, Formula 1 than it is now to start off with. When, uh, when, when, when we came in in 2016, I think there was the time where, where there was backmarker teams. So, you know, it was expected there is people which are not... Uh, uh, so fast, so we. I think we had a lot of less pressure than uh, than any other team coming in, which would come in now, because the expectation is all the teams are competitive now, all uh, all the teams uh, are stable now. So there is no need for teams. When we came in, there was a need for teams, so it was a completely different scenario. But it is very difficult as a job to do it, you know, and it hasn't uh, uh, become any easier, especially. And now a budget cap is in place. So if somebody even wants to come in competitive, says, oh, I just outspent everybody the first year or two, you cannot do that. You, you, you are, cannot do more than the other ones. The only thing what you have not got is the experience the other people have got, you know, and the history in the sport. So it is very, very difficult. I'm not saying it's, it's not doable, but I think uh, if, if, you, if you want to come in now, you need to take your time and really uh, uh, get yourself prepared that when you get into Formula One, that you are competitive as it is required by Formula One now. Because uh, as I said before, there is no weak team in, in the moment. So uh, I, I think it is very competitive. And uh, uh, obviously, you cannot fail. The, the FOM would not allow anybody to fail. So you need to make 100% sure that if you come in there, that you can prove that you will not fail. Yeah, and I think you've touched on it there a little bit, but I think a lot of fans have this memory of, you know, the past when there were 11 teams, 12 teams, you know, really, really full grid. Do you think that there is an ideal number of, of teams or does it just all come down to that? You you know, if you have 10 competitive teams, it's better than having 12 teams that, you know, you've got one or two that, I mean, that used to be the case before Haas came in. Do you think there is such a thing as, a, you know, an ideal amount of, of teams in Formula One or is that something that's kind of rooted in the past a little bit more? I, I, I think you're right in saying there is not an ideal number. If you've got 11 or 12 com very competitive teams, I think that's not bad, but also the uh, the commercial side of it needs to be back it up, you know, just to have more teams. And then, uh, because if you have more teams, you need to share the, uh, the money uh, by more people, which makes less for everybody. And then all of a sudden, even if you think you've got 12 competitive teams, some will end up with not enough money and they will fall back. And then you have to keep on uh, keeping these people around because they've got a license, because you cannot say you're not allowed. Because the thing in Formula One, there is no relegation. It's not like football. If in mm -hmm. football, you don't put the effort in and the financial means behind it, 
you're relegated and that's your destiny, you know. But in Formula One, once you're in, uh, you, you have the right to stay in there. Uh, uh, I, I, I wouldn't say forever, but for a long time, you know, because nothing is forever. But uh, 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 and, and, and that is the difficult bit. It almost feels like Formula One's protecting Andretti from itself in the fact that 2025 was way too early to even wrap your head around a team being ready to enter given the regulation change that you brought mentioned. I'm just curious, when you look at Andretti, what you know about him, General Motors, who expects to have an engine ready by 2028, that brand, do you expect to see success from that partnership? I mean, uh, if they take enough time, for sure it can be successful. And uh, as you just said, uh, uh, they if one tries to protect them from themselves, that could be because, but again, I, I don't have the information of what they submitted to them. You know, maybe they looked at that information and rightly you said, uh, uh, we want them, but we want to make sure that they are successful when they come, you know, protect them for themselves, you know, help them out, you know, in this thing. So I think uh, 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 F1 is, is is protecting all the teams, everybody involved in the sport. And uh, they didn't close the door completely. They said uh, 28, it's a, uh, it's a, Call it a new day. It's a new year. It's a long. It's it's quite a few years away. You know, it's not tomorrow, but uh, there there is still the door is open. Uh, uh, show us that you can get prepared and 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 be competitive by then. And and uh, I think we welcome you, Gunther. As it pertains to the here and now, I'd love to ask you about your career with Haas. Were you surprised that you would not be continuing managing Haas this season? Uh, a little bit, yes. A little bit, no. You know, it's in between. Uh, in, the, in the end, I saw what was happening last year, that uh, all the other teams are uh, ramping up, you know, their investments and things like this, and we couldn't follow. So, uh, obviously, I tried to go the same uh, way, but it wasn't possible. So, uh, you know, you have, to, uh, you have to say what you think. And then, uh, on one way, yes. In one way, no. Yeah, I just think... on that, I mean, towards the end of last season, did it sounds like maybe you started to have that feeling in Abu Dhabi last year. Did you kind of go into the paddock there and think this could be the last race or did it really kind of, did the situation just kind of evolve in the weeks after that into the, the decision itself? In, in Formula One, it can be always your last, your last race. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very true. <laughs> you never know when the last race comes, you know. <laughs> so, is that is that the mindset you've always had? Just say this could be it. So just enjoy yeah. it while we can. Yeah, no, but you don't go in with that mindset. I mean, in the end, yeah. you need to go in and uh, uh, you, to do the best job, you need to be positive. You cannot be afraid of, of something like this. And I'm still not afraid. And if it happens, it happens. And you just move on. You know, uh, I've got always a positive outlook on uh, on, on, uh, on most of the stuff I, I'm doing. So uh, there's always a chance. But it was like at some stage, it also comes, do you want to be there if you cannot compete? You know, that is you have to ask yourself. You cannot ask anybody anybody else. And uh, that, that, that came up uh, in, in my mind last year at some stage. And uh, then when it happened, I was like, OK, it's fine, you know, move on. There's a lot of good things to do in life, you know. I think if you look at the other teams and the investment that's going on, a number of them, I think most people would agree with you, Has does need something. So what, what was Gene's argument there to say that, we can continue as we are and we can be more competitive than the team was in the last last couple of years? I, I think, first of all, I, I don't want to speak for Haas now because I'm not there anymore. So, you, you know, I, I, I need to be uh, correct there. But uh, I don't know exactly how, how he thinks uh, to do it. You know, that's a question for him to be asked. And I think it's a legit question because uh, it's like because I didn't understand it as well. So the, the, I think there was, to me, there was no answer. Because if you see now what also, uh, what is it called now? Visa, Cash Up, <laughs> RB. Oh, I mean, yeah. I, I still am struggling with the names anyway. This we is all, all are. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, thanks. Thanks. I'm, I, if I, we're still if not I, sure what I we're going to call it. Name. Yeah, yeah exactly. articles and stuff. We have no idea. Yeah, um, exactly. So, uh, I mean, the investment they are making and also in the people by taking Tim Goss on and things like this, you know, uh, obviously they, they, they saw where they need to go to be competitive. When you reflect on the 10 years you were at Haas, what are some of the fondest memories that come to mind? I mean, the fondest memory is like yeah, being able to start a new Formula One team is something fantastic. You know, I mean, if you think back now, it's like, hey, uh, not many people have done that uh, in the good old days and uh, and now in the new days, uh, uh, not much. But the fondest memory is when we, when we hit the racetrack the first year in 2016. Uh, it's, 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 it's so cool. So uh uh you, you know you, you go out there everybody not everybody a lot of people and not maliciously think you will fail because uh, it it was uh, uh, we did that in, in a very different way than anybody else and you go out there 
you come to the test, you go out for the test, you you do your test normally, and then you go racing in in, in Melbourne and you score points. I mean, you know, it, it's for sure a, a very good memory that one. And Gunther, when you look back at the history of Haas, I mean, it's kind of littered with you know great moments, but also you guys have been attached to so many kind of incredibly dramatic moments or incredible storylines. There's been rich energy. You had the Mazepins, you know, obviously you had Roman's crash in Bahrain. That was, you know, just unbelievable that that happened. And then they got out of it. And it just, it, it always seemed that Haas was right in the middle of a lot of these, a lot of these situations, which for, in your position, you must've just thought to yourself, can we just have a normal year where we don't have something crazy happening at all times? Cause it's always felt like Haas has had every year. There's been something where you can point back to and say, that was the big storyline of Haas's season. Uh, did it feel like that when you were working there or did it kind of just come with the territory? Uh, you give me a flashback. Now I'm running away from this interview <laughs> yeah. now, you know, because I don't want to think about it, you know. so <laughs> Which was uh, the worst uh, flashback out of, out of those? <laughs> but there's, there's so many. Yes, you, you, you brought them up, all of them. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I get this flashback. It's like, wow, he's actually right. Uh, yeah. I always say, and we didn't try hard to create this drama. Can you imagine if we would have tried, you know? This just happened to us, you know, so without putting any effort into it. So, no, it is true, and I don't know why it happened. I mean, uh, but, but you know, we always, I think we always dealt as good as we could with it. Uh, and all the all the people, and, and I'm not pointing at me, I mean, everybody was always there to help whatever happened. We always found a way out of it, and I think a lot of our energy was consumed with these dramas and that for sometimes we didn't make the progress we should have made but it was all covered with, uh, with, with, with these things which were unexpected and to be honest I don't think we did a, a lot of things wrong to end up there there was just sometimes we were just ended up in, in bad circumstances but we always tried to find a way out of it so in the end you take it down as experience and by the way, it, it, now thinking back I mean I can joke about it the flashbacks it, it is not as bad because we always came out I wouldn't say on top of it, but at least even, you know, uh, uh, which is uh, which happens, you know. And I think part of it is always because we were always an underdog. We were uh, the smallest teams. We had less resources, uh, and, and that for it hits you. We were we were taking on really big boys here, you know. So uh, obviously uh, we could have a little bit luckier, but in the end, you know, there is no regrets of any of these things. Yeah, would you do things different now? But with hindsight, I mean, who wouldn't do things different? I mean, only a stupid man wouldn't do things different with hindsight, you know? So I would do things different because I know now what would happen. So, but in the end, it was also good fun, you know? Sometimes you think back, like when, you see, I can laugh about it. When you bring all these stories, I was like, yeah, he's actually right. But I still can smile about it, you know? So uh, it, it's actually okay. But it's, I think it's part of, of that story, of that Haas story, the first year, the first years of Haas. How much of a gap is that going to leave in your life? Because as you say, it's fun. It, you've got all these achievements behind you. I, how big a gap has it left already in this, this first month of of not getting ready for testing? Not, is it is it a relief? Uh, what, what's going through your mind? Uh, I would say it's not relief. I mean, I'm pretty happy now after 10 years of, of, of this space, going this space, because, I mean, we raised eight years, but it took two years to build up the team. Uh, to to have a little bit an easier, uh, uh, not like the stress all the time is pretty good, you know, for me and for my family, to be honest, you know, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm doing other stuff. I'm, I'm keeping myself busy. I'm not getting bored, you know, by no means, you know, I'm not sitting here and I'm not this guy, which oh, I won't desperately go testing. No, uh, if, if I go testing or racing, I want to do it for the right reason, not just not just to be around, you know, I want to be challenged to do something which I like to do. And in the moment, I've got quite a few things which I, I like to exploit to see what is uh, what what I can do. I mean, I've got my my own company, which uh, by no means I'm starting to run now. I've got a very good business partner, which is doing a good job. So I don't need to go there and mess that one up. That That's what I continue <laughs> to tell them. Don't worry. I let you get on with it because I just come around along to mess it up. So no, but uh, it's I'm keeping pretty busy, but it's good to have not the pressure always because it is also uh, repetitive, you know, Lawrence, when you uh, when you start to do it eight years. The pressure of going testing, yeah, it's nice, but you have done it eight times. Sometimes, you know, a human being, in my opinion, you need a new challenge to do something different. And the, and the challenge doesn't need to be the same as it was the last eight years. It can be something completely different, things you didn't have time to do, or you didn't even have time to look into it and to understand that what is out there, you know, for you. So I take it a little bit like this, but I'm not like dwelling on, oh, I want to be testing. No. Uh, I mean, I will show up at some races, hopefully doing some uh, some work. I'm in touch with a lot of people I got uh, friendly with over the 
over my career, you know, which uh, uh, I talk with what is happening and things like this. But just to go back to testing, like I went the last eight years, uh, you know, it's like, oh, when, when are you going to get for another job? I don't know if I want another job the same as I had before, you know, because I've done it. I've done it. So I need to move on, just a lateral move. Maybe it's not uh, uh, satisfying for me. When you think of the man that started Haas 10 years ago and where you're at now, where do you feel like you've grown the most as an individual? My white hair grown the most, you know. That is. As you said it, not I, me. <laughs> you thought that, you know. So. <laughs> so, uh, 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 no, as an individual, uh, you just get uh, uh, more mature. You, you know, uh, as I said before, before 10 years ago, I couldn't wait to go testing even six years ago. Now it's like more I've done it, you know. But what is what is next, what I can do to make things somehow better with the experience I gained, you know. Where where can I contribute something uh, to make something better, you know. And it, it could be in Formula 1, could be in, in any other industry. But you grow as a human being because... We have been through a lot, as we said before, and that always makes you mature. And uh, uh, you can never uh, develop like actually making these experiences. Then when you really learn them and do them, then all of a sudden you have done it. You know how to react because it happened to you before. And that I think is the most important thing. All these ups and downs also mentally over the last uh, eight years, you know, I mean, they, they are not easy. But now when, once you have done it, it's a lot easier to take it. You know, because you have been there and you, I call it now survived, obviously, I, I don't mean I, I, you, you survived the pressure, nothing, nothing else. So mm -hmm. I, I think that is where, where, you, where I mature most. You joked about the white hair, Gunther. I mean, what, what was left of mine is gone <laughs> from working in Formula One and I've not even been doing your job. Um, <laughs> just on that, uh, you know, on, on looking for something else, it's quite interesting as well, you know, thinking if, you know, let's say a team did come to you about a similar role, the, the, position you had at Haas and the, the relationship you have with Gene is probably something that you wouldn't get, you know, at any other team. If you think about the way it is, is that something that weighs on your mind as well? That, you know, the situation you had there, the, you know, the control that you're able to have over the team, you go into, you know, if you go into a bigger team, for example, you've probably got a lot more people to answer to. There's a lot more at play above your head. That, that would probably be a situation that you might find a little bit given, given the 10 years at Haas, I could see how that would be a lot more frustrating to have to deal with if you were put into that situation. I think you're right. I wouldn't call it frustrating because I would know, uh, as you just explained, what it will, uh, uh, what it would involve. You know, so you cannot be frustrated if you're told it. This, this is what it is. It would be much more difficult. That's why I said a lateral move it would be very difficult for me. But uh, you know, you never know what other teams are doing. And if we, if we always uh, look at uh, Formula One, how it evolves over the years. You know, the Formula One we have got now, ten years ago. Nobody would have thought that it would go this uh, this way. So maybe something else comes up in Formula One in the next five years, you know, and the expertise and the stuff I've done is needed. That's why I said I'm in no hurry just to make a lateral move like it is now, because I think what you just explained is what it would be if I would go into any other team right now. But maybe in two, three years, something changes, like Formula One has changed the last five years from what it was. And you remember it. It was a different sport, you know. It was a different a, a way of, of, of going racing than it is now. And Gunter, one real downside to you leaving is that we're going to lose your um, your uh, addition to, to Netflix. We're going to lose you as a somebody to go and talk to on a Thursday and get information about what's going on and opinions about what's going on in Formula One. Um, I, does that appeal to you to, to, to be a kind of maybe part of the, I don't want to know about the media, but you know, uh, certainly someone who's still uh, relevant within the sport and can produce ideas for the sport because you know we, we've seen at Formula One, for example, Ross Braun moved into that role and really shook things up. Do, do, do you see yourself in a position like that as well going forward? Uh, I, I wouldn't say directly. Like I, I mean, I respect Ross a lot, and when he came along for Formula One, it was a very good move from uh, uh, Chase Carey at the time to get Ross on board. You know, because he understands it. I wouldn't say uh, you cannot replicate things. I, I mean, I will. I mean, for the you know. You know short future, uh, short term and medium term, I will stay around because I will come to a few races, you know, and be around. But I don't know if I will have an official role or if it would be just Gunther, which would be even better for you guys if it is just Gunther, because then I have not to report to anybody and I can say whatever I want, which is sometimes pretty dangerous as well, you know. So, <laughs> uh, 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 but uh, no, uh, I think you will have me around. And as you see, I I'm pretty happy to do an interview with you guys now. It's very 
I, I wouldn't say normal that somebody who left the company a, a month ago uh, is now having having something like this with you guys, which I really enjoy because I enjoy to work with everybody in Formula One, and uh, I, I, I'm happy to tell the story. You know, does that does that apply as well to kind of uh, sort of punditry kind of opportunities? Because I think some people in Formula One they think as soon as you've moved into the media side of things, it can be quite difficult to to move back into the sport because you've kind of you've put a lot of opinions out there. You maybe have been a bit more outspoken about certain things. Is that is that something that appeals to you? Because I'm sure that the majority of people, if not everyone listening to this podcast, would absolutely love the idea of you getting a Sky Sports microphone every week <laughs> and kind of just being able to talk about your opinions on the race or you know what you whatever the latest controversy is. Is that something that is as appealing to you as it is to to everyone else? Uh, I mean, I'm not saying uh, in the moment. I'm not saying yes or no to anything, you know. But I, I, I go back to your first question. Said if that would, if you go into that, you cannot go back. I, I always think you can go back because I wouldn't change, you know. When I was in the team, I wasn't any different than I would be being on TV. And that's what I say. I, for me, it's no difference, you know. I don't put a show on just for TV, or I just put a show on for a team, you know. That is what is me. I've got my opinion. I mean, uh, as I always say, uh, some people don't like my opinions, and which I'm perfectly happy with. You know, I'm not getting upset. I mean, it's like, uh, but and, and that's it. You know, so I don't think that would dis disturb me. That would, uh, I wouldn't do that because then I would already think the next step. Then I couldn't go back. I think there is, you know, as I said, I, I say yes or no to anything in the moment. I look at it, what is out there, and then something will, something nice will come up, and uh, you guys will get some opinions from me, hopefully <laughs> during the year. <laughs> Uh, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm sure I see uh, around uh, in a few races. I don't think I'm going to go to all because that's a lot of work going to 24 races. I just warn you, you know. So, yeah. well, you're getting, I, your you're yeah. getting your weekends back after all this time. You're, gonna, you're not going to know what to do with all that extra, all those extra Saturdays and Sundays off. I, I think I find something. I think I find <laughs> something, Nate. You know, don't worry, you know, at least for a while. Yeah. You said you've been keeping busy and that you have a couple of hobbies. What have you been up to? I don't have uh, not a, a lot of hobbies. No, I've been up to, uh, as I said, a lot of people uh, uh, contacted me about uh, different things. Uh, uh, you know, and when you're away for 10 years and I've got, as I said, my own business, I've got a few things going just to clean up stuff, which you didn't have time to do in your life, you know, and taking it on at your own time, not just always okay, this is the schedule. I need to get done by this, this, and this time to go this, there, and then, and then uh, for example, last weekend, I went to Daytona to a 24-hour race because I like it. I just went there for a day, just for fun. No job involved or nothing, just for fun. This is things I like to do. I can spend time with my family, which obviously are happy in the moment that I'm home. I don't long, I don't know how long that lasts, as we all know, you know, so, but uh, they are pretty happy to have me around. So, no, it's, it's uh, I've got, I keep busy, but that uh, I'm not overdoing it. And I said, I'm not getting stressed out. I'm not, I need to do this, that, and the other. I just do what is coming in. I deal with it and then uh, see what, uh, what what I ended up to doing. Any trips planned or meetings planned with Mattia Bonotto? I know he's a good friend of yours. Yeah, uh, I actually need to, uh, to to call him tomorrow. I spoke with him last time, last week. So uh, uh, I'm sure I will see him uh, in some of time. When, because, you, you know, uh, where he's got his wine is about 50 Ks for my place. So we always meet up there, you know. Yeah, it's very close there. Yeah, so he has to travel anyway. And for me, it's very close, you know. So in summer, I, I, I'm going to spend summer again in Northern Italy. So for sure, we we'll meet up then, if not before at the race. I don't know which races he's going to this year. Well, the two of you can make quite a good dent into that now. <laughs> <laughs> we can taste a lot of wine and now it's even good to, it, it, I think that the, the, the first vintage is ready to, to drink, you know. So at least we can have some proper wine this year, you know. And we will not be filming it because you don't want to see that. You have such a unique perspective working with veteran drivers. You've also worked with very young and kind of novice drivers as well. When you look at drivers like Charles Leclerc and Lando Norris, who just got you know massive contracts in this sport, what do you think of these relatively young drivers getting these kind of long-term contracts? I, I think we are now uh, in Formula One. Uh, teams just, if they have somebody good, they just want to make it stable. You know, I mean, these guys have proven that they are good, you know, and mm -hmm. they can stay good. I, I, I think stabilize something, what, what you have, and then work on the team instead of, obviously, the problem becomes when the team is not delivering a good car, then these drivers get frustrated. You know how that works, then the, the opposite way. So a lot of them will have performance closes in, but I think it's a good thing if, if there's a possibility to do this because 
by now we all know that Lando and, and, and Charles, they are good. You know, if they get in the right equipment, they can win a world championship. And that is that that is that next generation from what we have now the world uh, the world champions like uh, Fernando and uh, Luis and stuff like this. So I think it's quite a good idea from the teams to assure that they've got stability in the team with these guys. What about the drivers? If you were advising some of those drivers, because sometimes the key is to remain flexible and move at the right time just as the team's coming up. But um, yeah, Lando especially tying himself down to McLaren. We can understand, I guess, why Max has done it at Red Bull, but Charlotte Ferrari as well. Do, do you think those are, are good long-term uh, options for the drivers too? I think not all of them can be right. Huh? So somebody will find out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, you've got three world champions a year because that's what they all three want to do. Just the three you, you just said now. So... I, I think it's it's one of those things, as I, as I said to, to, to Katie, I'm sure they've got performance clauses in there for the team now. I think it has turned a little bit uh, in that way, that they've got the way to get out if the team is not performing a certain way. But also for the drivers, at least they have got time to get the team in the direction they want it to be. And, and for sure, somebody will be disappointed. And then it creates drama, and that's good for you guys. That's right. <laughs> We all, um, everybody in, in F1 just looks after you guys, you know? Yeah. You something. <laughs> That's a real main character syndrome that it will just exist for us. We, I like that. It makes us feel really important. Um, you, just you on those contracts as well. <laughs> <laughs> on those contracts as well. I mean, um, I think it was just after he won the championship in 21 that Max got that really, really long deal. And if you look at the history of deals before that, there'd been a few longish deals, but that was the first one we saw that was that long. Did that feel like a turning point in the driver market? Because it seems like since then, like you say, it has kind of almost forced teams and drivers to want to kind of lock down for longer. When that happened, was there any part of you that thought, oh, wow, that's maybe going to have reverberations down? Or has it has it actually been building for a lot longer than that, like behind the scenes? No, I, I think you're right. When, when it happened with Max, everybody saw, okay, Max will not be on the market, call it like this, for five years. So we need to do something. So we are not ending up fighting for... Uh, you know, for one of the other ones. And then it started, people looked in, this is what I want. I tr uh, I trust this driver. You know, this is what I want. I give them uh, a, a long a long term contract as well. And you're right. Max was the first one. Red Bull. So the guy is just so good. You know, let's sign him up. Let's let's make that decision. So we are not having uh, uh, having to find the next Max. We are keeping the Max. And so what's it really like behind the scenes during a silly season? How much are you talking to all the available drivers on the grid? How many of those small conversations happen that we never pick up on? And how much of it is us lot, the media, just making mountains out of molehills? <laughs> ooh, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know you've, you've leaned forward normally now. There, for is, the... there, there is never smoke without fire, guys. You know that. So normally, uh, you guys, when you pick something up, there was something going on that out, out of the blue. I, I think we know all the all the outlets which we can which are not trustworthy anyway which they just make stuff up and people say yeah i mean they said it but it's not really going to happen uh, you know the talk it's always going on and uh, you know i i now speak uh, running has your opportunities uh, i mean you say hello to the drivers to the good ones but you know they would never come to you so you just try to keep an eye on what is happening in the market which is interesting for you and try to get an opportunity which otherwise you couldn't get like uh, when uh, uh, last year with, with Nico, I mean, in a normal year, it was very difficult to get a Nico Hülkenberg. We tried twice and he refused, but being where he was without a job at the time, there was an opportunity and you need to think about this once. And, and there's a lot of talking uh, 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 with these people. First of all, you have to see like with Nico, if he's even interested to do something, you know, coming back. And then you talk and you see if, if you can make it work. Uh, and then obviously you see who else is around and you speak, say, hey, if it's a driver with a contract, is there a possibility that you could get out and that if you want to get out of it? And, and that is what you're doing. There is quite a lot of talk going on without real the focus. This is going to happen, you know, but you, you, you need, always need to keep the conversation going that if you see some opportunity that you are, uh, are there when it happens. I think most fans would say that they hate dynasties, that they root for parity, but dynasties, I think, can actually be a really good thing for a sport. I mean, you look at the NFL and NBA, we've we've had plenty of them because it gives 
most fans across the country, across the world, a, a villain to root against, right? And I think that Red Bull has certainly become that in Formula One as of late. Do you foresee us getting another season where Max and Red Bull continues to dominate, or do you foresee other teams continuing to close that gap? Uh, I, I see it. Other teams will close the gap with the with, with the regulations now stable. I think there is a good opportun opportunity for the other teams to close the gap. And uh, uh, obviously, a lot of uh, everybody learned last year which direction to go with the car. So I think that it will close. They, they have been very good, so they will be still very strong, in my opinion. But I think there is more opportunities for somebody else to win a race than it was last year. You mentioned about the driver market and talking to drivers and stuff like that. When you see Max, and you know we, we all know how good he is on track, and he's always kind of been... He's not changed a massive amount away. He's always been kind of cool, collected. He, you know, he doesn't really like to talk too much about you know things that have happened. He just likes to get down and do it. What, what as a as a team boss of another team, when you've seen that, what of the things, what things have stood out about him that you think, well, that's so impressive. Knowing knowing what it is like to work with drivers behind the scenes, what what sort of things stand out when you see him? Obviously, the performance on track is something that's very clear to see. But is there something that when you see of Max, you think, well, that that is what really makes him special, you know, more special maybe than a lot of the other drivers that are on the grid right now? Absolutely. First of all, his talent, and uh, he knows about it, but he doesn't overstress that he, in the moment, is the best driver. He's just doing his job, gets along with it, has got an opinion about things, uh, don't, doesn't dwell on them. You know, he says he's, he, 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 he says what he thinks and then moves on, you know, which I think is, is, is pretty cool. I mean, and, uh, you know, he's, I think he's surrounded by a good group of people, his father included. You know, which keep him grounded as well. Uh, 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 his manager, uh, I think he's just doing it. He is living for this world championship. You know, he likes racing cars. He he does other stuff as well in racing cars, but mm. he doesn't try to do anything different than that. You know, he's just a young guy which is enjoying what he's doing and sticking to it. You know, and uh, I think he said it a few times. I don't know how long he will be racing. I think today he doesn't like it anymore. He will stop. He will not drag it on just to make money. You know. He would just stop and do something different what he likes to do. And how important is it to get that chemistry between the teammates, right? Especially when you're fighting for championships, because we've seen extremes, obviously Max dominating Checo recently, but then not so long ago, Lewis and Nico going for championships. That relationship between drivers, how much do you factor that in when, when you've been making decisions, albeit maybe not fighting for the championships during those years? Yeah, yeah, we didn't... Uh... You factor it in, but but uh, you need to sort that one out uh, when they are in the team, in my opinion. You, you, you cannot always plan for everything before. I, I think you try to get as a team the best two drivers you can get. You never get a not good driver just to please the other one, because that is not good for the other one. And you just uh, deal with, uh, uh, with, with the, if there is rivalry at the track, you have to deal with how it comes along. You know, that for... Uh, uh, when 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 team principles are critiqued or why you didn't tell them what to do because they both want to do their best and obviously they fight for it because they both want to be uh, number one and uh, th but that is what you want because then they push each other as well so sometimes it it goes overboard as we all know you, you know with, with, with some teammates but in the end as long as you get a grip of it after 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 it happened it's okay you know because they that makes them push each other. If if you if you make it too easy for the number one driver, you don't get you're not sure that you get hundred percent out of him. Maybe he could do better if he's pushed by his teammates, which is very good as well. So uh, I personally never looked into it, or oh, they need to get done, they need to be mates. No, I, I always looked at I need to get the two best drivers I can get. And with the rest, we deal afterwards. With that in mind, hypothetical situation, we're going into 24 season, Steiner F1 is on the grid. You're looking as competitive as Red Bull. you got any driver you want to pick from. Which two drivers do you pick from the current crop? I would for sure pick uh, Max. And uh, the second one uh, would be... A, a you say I could pick whatever I want. Well, yeah. everyone's out of con I mean, this is very hypothetical now, but everyone... Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no, no I, 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 I wouldn't say no to an Alonso. Mm. Max and Alonso, you know, because Alonso is still, I mean, he has got the experience, he's doing a good job with the team, he's still one of the best racers out there, and, you know, I I, I think he, he could still win a championship if he's in the right equipment. And you could see those personalities pairing well together? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I think more gray hair. 
But like you said, I mean, right, a good problem to Netflix have. Is dream yeah, exactly. It's a good problem I mean, to have if they push each other, you know? And and Just, imagine the uh yeah, the, the next Netflix episode. Uh, Gunter Steiner in his office with his two drivers, Fernando Alonso <laughs> and Max Verstappen. Yeah, that, that would be a difficult one smashing. because they, they are pretty hard headed as well, you know. So between the, yeah. between the three of us, that would be a good fun <laughs> for, for you guys, not for, not not for the three in there. <laughs> You mentioned um, you mentioned obviously there Max and Fernando. We've obviously got Lewis has won you know seven world championships, but we've got a bunch of young drivers as well. Leclerc, Lando, Oscar Piastri last year mm-hmm. just had an amazing rookie season. You've been in Formula One for a long time, you know, even stretching back before Haas. And I think it does feel like this is potentially the most talented grid we've had in Formula One. Do you think is that a, is that a fair assessment? Do you think just looking at the drivers we have from kind of top to bottom? Absolutely, absolutely. It's very competitive. There is nobody in there which doesn't belong in there in the moment. I mean, they're all very good and they're all very young. Now, it, it, it uh, see who comes out on top of it, you know, because they say they're all and they, and and some of them will be there will be around for a long time because they're very young. I mean, th- this was a group of of guys, as you just said. Uh, I mean, Piastri is young, but uh, uh, Leclerc, uh, uh, Norris, uh, Albon. Russell, they all came up together in Formula 2, Formula 3, or very close to each other, and they, they were very talented, you know, and I think behind them, there is a little bit of a hole, there was not the same amount of good talent anymore, like that group of people, but they, they will be around very uh, a, long, uh, a long time, because they are still very young, all of them. Is there anyone on the current grid who you think is massively underrated by, whether it's by fans or by kind of the media perception, is there anyone who stands out as like, that guy really needs a better with reputation or a better chance to kind of move up to a bigger team or anything like that? If you would have asked me last year, I would have told you uh, uh, Albon, because mm. I think he's very talented. He didn't, but he showed it last year in 23 what he can do. You know, he's very good. I mean, before 23, I think uh, uh, Alex was underrated. Yeah. Any team yeah. boss that you think is underrated and deserves maybe more credit? No, they're all fantastic, Katie. <laughs> Are you going to, just on that, are you going to miss those, those meetings? I mean, the one in Netflix that stands out is the one where oh, Christian yeah. and Toto, you know, you got a problem, change your fucking car. Like, are you going to miss some of that drama being away from Formula One now? Because I think that is what has made Netflix so entertaining is that it has lifted the lid on that. And in that scene, I have to say, you look like you're having the time of your life just sort of sat there mm-hmm. watching it all unfold. I mean, those moments, are you going to kind of regret not being in some of those meetings or are you actually happy to leave the kind of the, the stress and the heartache of that behind? No, but uh, some of them are very, they are very, uh, I would say intense and uh, entertaining is maybe the wrong word, but some of them are pretty boring as well. So some you will miss, some you will be happy not to be there. It's always a mix of things, you know, but uh, no, I, 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 I mean, my relationship with all the other team principally was pretty good, you know. I mean, we always could have a laugh about things as well. That's what I always say, you need to be serious when you do business, but you don't take, don't take yourself too serious because that is... I think that's not cool, you know, because it's we are still in a sport entertainment business. You know, uh, we are not saving lives, to be honest. You know, so we need to have uh, it needs to have a fun uh, element as well in it. Well, that's why you're such a fan favorite because you're down to earth and so relatable. Uh, I speak for the boys here. Thank you so much for joining us. We have so much respect for you, Gunther, and the impact you've had on Formula One. Don't be a stranger, and uh, we can't wait to see what you tackle next. All right. Thank you very much for having me, guys. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Thank you so Appreciate much. Appreciate Yeah. You, we'll bye. be back next week for another episode of Unlap. Be sure to check that out. Thanks for watching, guys. Cheers. Cheers.